Since the 1920s, we've had broadcasting in this country by radio, which later gave way to television in the 40s and 50s. And after World War II, television got to be a big deal. But there were only three major networks. That's a long time with the model not changing a great deal. But since the 70s and 80s, the number of different ways that you can get programming has exponentially increased. So broadcasters for the first time in 50 years are now suddenly having to react to that. And a lot of things still remain to be precipitated out by the market, by the courts, and everything else. But I think the one thing that everybody involved in media has to realize in their heart of hearts going forward is it's never going to be the same as it was 50 years ago. And the one thing that we can depend on from now on is change. As digital distribution develops more and more, individuals as well as networks are better apt to connect to specific audiences. Wide-reaching platforms like YouTube and Twitch.tv allow content creators like Akinola Verissimo, aka Black Anola, to entertain scores of people. On his YouTube channel, you might find parodies, music videos, additional comedy, commentary, all about the most popular PC game in the world, League of Legends, developed by Riot Games. I think that the model of direct digital distribution is really the way of the future. People aren't really in the mindset anymore to watch a whole bunch of stuff that they're not going to be ever interested in watching. They want exactly what they want, when they want it, for a fair price. This direct contact provides the benefit of knowing what the audience wants. The fact that I have so many subscribers, 22,000, in just this short amount of time, six months, is absolutely mind-blowing. And I can really focus on giving fans what they want. Uh, you get awesome, awesome feedback from your audience saying, oh, this particular video you did wasn't really my cup of tea. Here's what I'd like to see next video. You get that connection with your fans that you really don't get as much with uh, other avenues. There's a whole bunch of analytics that you can see what's working for you and what's not working for you, and then use that to your advantage to make the best possible video next time. But there may be a disadvantage. There's a huge competitive battlefield out there. Everyone is creating videos at such a huge frequency that if you're not quick enough to act, someone may beat you to the punch. And while there are a lot of copies and rehashes of popular media online, it's all about how you can stand out. So it's not necessarily over for you. If somebody comes out with an idea that you've been working on, that just gives you more motivation to make it as best as you can. Clearly, a competitive digital market found in services like YouTube, Netflix, and Hulu fosters creativity and a diversity of content for producers. Vice President of Digital Media Services at Fremantle Media, the media company that made the first collaboration with Hulu for its in-house shows, speaks on how content is affected by this type of distribution. One of the strengths of, the, of, that, of that model is that you're not tied to um, a broadcast network's um, length. So like a good example of, of that was uh, Arrested Development came out on Netflix which maybe not, is not exactly a direct distribution model, but it's, it's, it's closer than, than the broadcast networks. And every episode had a wildly different length, which meant that the producers told the story they wanted to tell, and sometimes it was shorter and sometimes it was longer, but it was the story they wanted to tell at the length they wanted to tell it. It wasn't dictated on how many commercials needed to be in that um, a half hour or that hour. So where do these technologies leave the broadcasters who are dependent on the viewers of appointment television? Managing in the TV industry since the late 70s, professors Dave Culver and Paul Gluck, station managers at Drexel University and Temple University of Philadelphia, respectively, weighed in on this question. So much of any big enterprise like television programming has to do with money. And while you and I can put together a cable channel and find alternate ways of distribution that bypass cable television and broadcast television. We're putting together a show that costs $19. If you want to do The Sound of Music live for three hours, it's very difficult to do that without substantial financial backing. And my fear is that an awful lot of these alternatives, which are great for what they are, 
won't allow for the economic realities of producing major broadcasting on video, be it television or whatever else. Broadcasters such as CBS, NBC, ABC, and Fox distribute content to a vast TV audience, delivering major events like the Super Bowl. The money the networks make on these broadcasts is contingent on two things. Ad revenue. It's on the basis of ratings that you legitimize what you charge advertisers for their ads, and that's the modality of broadcast television in terms of profitability. And retransmission fees. Retransmission fees are paid by cable and satellite providers for distribution of programming content. But in comes an emerging digital distributor called Aria, broadcasting content without paying these fees, charging their consumers $8 a month. Um, Aereo is a, a particular uh, enterprise, a company that engages in OTT, over-the-top television, which is uh, internet-delivered TV that comes to a box on top of your home receiver um, in some ways like cable, but, but uh, you know, a broadband-based technology. And, and my sense is that it was so hard fought among um, uh, corporate entities, among broadcasters, to make sure that cable companies were, were adding value by paying retransmission fees. One of the reasons why cable stations are paying retransmission fees to television stations, because that stuff's copyrighted and you can use a different technology, you can send it by way of carrier pigeon or electric banana, but the point remains somebody owns that copyright and somebody has the right to be able to determine how it's going to be used. The head of CBS, Les Moonves, has famously said, you know, that we, we pay a lot to produce programming, we pay a lot to acquire the rights to programming. Why should um, a distributor take it without paying some percentage of the value of our content cable does, why shouldn't Aereo do the same, uh, to paraphrase Moonves. And, and I tend to agree with him. I, you know, there, there was a time when cable was simply another utility, and, and networks really didn't, uh, you know, emphatically demand retransmission fees. The major broadcasters have filed petition with the Supreme Court to hear a case against the up-and-coming Aereo for copyright infringement. A familiar story as those broadcasters took cable companies to court for the same reason in the 1940s. Can the major networks compromise with Aereo, which now stands as a David against the TV conglomerate Goliaths? Will we see a new model of TV roll out of OTT and new digital distribution technologies? And that's what's going to make the difference in terms of the future of broadcasting, is taking advantage of the new technologies rather than just resisting them. It is my belief that in the end, um, the television stations we watch today may very well turn in their spectrum and go into some kind of OTT delivered uh, strategy. One thing's for sure, producers, content makers, and technological innovators will continue to find more methods of reaching their audience and catering directly to them. Do what you do best, do it, do it well. Uh, do it big and loud, and hopefully at some point the people you think of as competitors will feel the need to become your partners. And the successful broadcasters, cablecasters, producers, or whatever, are going to be the people who can take advantage of that change. Not fight against it, but take advantage of it. And those are the folks that are really clever. If you've ever had an inkling or an idea that you want to share to the world, it has never, ever, ever been easier than to jump on YouTube or any other video sharing platform and just tell your stories of the world, whether it be music videos or blogging or music creation, things with cats, cooking, literally whatever that you can do, you can showcase it to the world. And if you're good enough, maybe make a nice living off of it. At this time, radio station WRUR-FM concludes broadcast activities for the day. 
WRUR-FM is owned and operated by the University of Rochester and operates at an assigned frequency of 88.5 megahertz in stereo is authorized by the Federal Communications Commission in Washington, D.C. On behalf of the staff and management of WRUR-FM, I wish you a pleasant good night. We will return to the air at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. So I'll see if that works.